I am, we are, this is Norwood. All right, welcome to I Am Norwood. This week I am here with uh, one of our residents who inspired my idea for this. Long time and soon to be retired, uh, as I am, will be as well, uh, Councilman Barry Scott. <laughs> Barry, how are you? I'm fantastic, Paul. Doing well on this beautiful day. It's like yes, springtime it in the Rockies. It's fantastic. <laughs> so lucky. Yes, indeed. Uh, good day for a walk around town. and. Uh, you grew up here, right? You're, were you born here? I no, I grew up here. We camped in Norwood when I was about two years of age in 1937. We came from Larchmont, New York, where my mother's people lived. They came all over from Ireland and uh, settled there. Okay, you're a Westchester guy. I didn't know that. That's a, that's a, I learned something new already. <laughs> yeah. So, Tell, tell us about Norwood during uh, what you'd call your childhood or wonder years here. Well, New York, back in the 40s and 50s, I had a population around 12 to 1,500. So you can well imagine there was no development at all in Norwood. There were no homes east of Piermont Road. Most of Tapan Road, uh, to the west side of Tapan Road, past Broadway, was not developed at all. There was no development in the Fox Hill area. Uh, a lot fewer homes. Uh, everything was wide open. Okay, uh, okay. It was beautiful. As a result, there was very little traffic. Very rarely did you see a car on Broadway. Very rarely. <laughs> Which meant that all the kids, all the kids, we rode bikes all the town, all over town. And we were never impeded by traffic. We, at one time, we counted, we were sitting uh, on Broadway, and we were counting how long would it take for a car to come by? Cars would come by, maybe one car every 15 minutes. So you can imagine how little, there was no activity at all. There'd be some activity in the summertime when people from the urban areas, New York City, Hudson County, would come to Norwood. They thought this was the country. Huh. And as a result, we had all kinds of springs in Norwood. They would come with their bottle jugs to get water from the springs, the wells. Okay. That was great because on Piedmont Road there was a place, there was a, uh, a little, uh, well, it was a hot dog stand and uh, people love the hot dogs and of course the, the fathers love the, the cold beer. Uh, <laughs> it was quite nice. It was called Maple Grove and uh, it, it was good. Good times. Hot dog stand itself was called Maple Grove or that, that area? The, the stand itself was called Maple Grove. Okay, okay. Sorry, I and missed that. that. There, like there, was, there, actually, there was no development at all from uh, the Erie Railroad track to uh, Piedmont Road, except this little section called Yorkview, where I live. There are 11 model homes here because the developer had planned back in the 20s to build apartments and houses all the way from Railroad Avenue to 9W. They also planned high rises, commercial. They anticipated at least, at least 75,000 people living in the area. But the depression came, they went belly up. But still, the 11 model homes are here still. Where are they located today in Norwood? 14th Street and 15th Street. I live on 15th Street. And the concept was the concept where, by the way, it was a common green. All the homes faced each other. Not okay. the street. The, the, the kitchens, kitchens face the street, 14th Street and 15th Street. There was a common sidewalk. And everyone just played on everyone's lawn. Didn't matter. Okay, okay. Played ball, whatever. <laughs> you had mentioned great. something about the orientation of those streets. What, what was the full story behind that? It, what they wanted to do was make it more rustic. Okay. And they wanted to it up. So therefore, the homes faced each other. The living rooms faced each other, faced the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it gave a, 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 a walking down the sidewalk, the sidewalk was still there in parts. <laughs> it gave a wonderful rural uh, aspect to it, I thought. Okay, okay. Uh, you've mentioned over the course of the time that I've known you, in uh, full disclosure, you were, I was your running mate or you were my running mate, depending how you want to phrase it, when I, uh, 
when I ran for council. Um, you had yep. mentioned uh, there's a history of, I guess, uh, hunting around here in, in the earlier days, correct? Oh, definitely so. The rite of passage when you were either 14 or 15 years of age, you got your first shotgun. So all, all my friends yeah, had good. shotguns. And the first day of hunting season, we all played hooky. Everyone played hooky. <laughs> we went hunting. Okay. And of course, when the deer knew, the deer all left town. They caught the bus <laughs> and left town. So anything we, the only thing we ever get, uh, bagged were rabbits. That was about it. Okay, okay. What, what, another reason why there were very few deer at the time was because there were a lot of poachers in Norway. Poachers, uh, you said? Poachers, yeah. Okay. Deer meat was a, a, a great commodity and a lot of families that needed the meat, quite frankly. So they would go, in the summertime, you hear shotguns going off, and, you know, another deer came down. <laughs> I know some families in town, that's, that's a valuable source of their protein, where deer, was deer meat. Okay, okay. Uh, I was going to ask you, um, where, where today was where you would typically hunt the most? Is there an area in Norwood now that was... Uh, we, we, we hunted there? from the Erie Railroad track. Okay. All, all the way up to Alpine. Okay. That was a large expanse and encompassed part of Closter, part of Rockley. Uh, be out all day long. What's the biggest thing you ever clipped when you were hunting? Rabbit. That's okay. it. <laughs> That's it. I, you never, I, you, very rarely would you see a deer during hunting, see, hunting season. Okay. And even non hunting season, there are very few deer. Not like today. Not like today. Oh. In fact, I woke up this night, uh, in the middle of the night this past evening, around three o'clock in the morning, and about 10 feet from my front door was a deer sleeping on the grass. <laughs> <laughs> there are balls on but, that one. <laughs> yeah. And you know, there were, there were no uh, coyotes around that time. So the deer didn't have any natural predators. Okay, okay. But it, I think it was the poaching that really did it. It kept the deer population down. Okay. In addition to hunting, I think uh, we'd also talked in the past, I guess, about uh, certain uh, maybe prohibition era features to the town. What can you tell me about that? Well, uh, prohibition was big time in Norwood because there were all kinds of stills in Norwood. And the booze left Norwood via the railroad track, the uh, okay. West Shore Railroad. And it started with uh, around the Derrick Hall property. There was a tunnel from the Derrick Hall property all the way to the railroad track. And the tunnel connected two houses plus the Derrick Hall property. So it fed into the railroad track. And the stories I heard, and Larry Derrick Hall will verify this, <laughs> is that the trains would stop, pick up the booze and keep on going. Okay. And the feds, heard about this and raided it and the fed was one of the, one of the feds were, were, were shot and killed oh wow but then the feds blocked the blocked the tunnel okay okay uh, you had mentioned that uh, i think last time we talked about this you had mentioned a place called whitmer's on Japan road how did that factor in oh whitmer's was right across the street from where derrick Holtz used to be uh it's where the nursing home is right now i was going to ask you okay okay that it, was a, uh, it was a it was a owned by uh Mr. Woodman, Roy Woodman, Roy Woodman, one of his sons was in my class. And it was a bar, light restaurant. And all the troops during World War II at Camp Shanks would come down when they had their R&R and drank there. And a lot of pinball machines, it was a place, it was a place that young kids loved to go to. You know, if, you, if you were invited to Woodman's Tavern by Roy, you had one of the best days in your life, playing the pinball machines. That was, okay. oh my God, pinball machines. Are you kidding me? Unreal. It was fantastic. And the Woodmans had horses. Mm -hmm. So they were always riding around town on their horses. And we had, we loved to ice skate, you know, but there were a couple of ponds where the golf course is. We used to go ice skating there. Mm -hmm. And also we got, went ice skating in the woods. Oh, wow. That because the, the, the uh, Ludlow Creek was not drained. Had, it really wasn't much of a creek at all. When they did a deep in Ludlow Creek, it kind of drained a lot of the swamp area. But we used to go uh, ice skating on over tree stumps and what have you. And also another thing was 
we used to go trapping. I had a line of traps for muskrats. Oh, wow. <laughs> and every, mus every muskrat pelt I got uh, was 75 cents. And 75 cents back in, let's say, 48, 49 was a lot of money for a kid. Because nobody got an allowance. I mean, you know. <laughs> so it was fun. Growing up in Norway was just unbelievably fantastic. It really was. How long was Whitmer's here? When did that? Uh, be First time I was in Norwood was uh, for a wedding uh, at what became, I guess, eventually the catering hall there. Yeah, uh, they sold out. I'd say in the uh, in the early, or oh, maybe late fifties. Okay. okay. There's a period, all kinds of owners after that. It, it had about five to seven different owners. Changed the name each time. Okay. Uh, the, the creek you refer to, where is that today? Is that, is it, is that still in town? It's, 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 yeah, it's right by the pond. It's east of the pond. Okay. It's called okay. Ludlow's. It, it's, on the map, it's called Ludlow's Ditch, but I don't like the word ditch. I call it creek, <laughs> you know, Ludlow Creek. It's, it really is a creek. It's not a ditch. Okay. okay. <laughs> it drains from Rockley all the way into the uh, Hackensack Water Reservoir. Okay, okay. Uh, and I, you, you had mentioned uh, the years you'd, You'd be doing various uh, ice skating and everything. Uh, you were Norwood Public School class of '49, correct? That is correct. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> that was, you know, you know, my class size was about 27. Yeah, I guess the total enrollment in the school was maybe because we had full full day kindergarten back then, maybe 225 or 250. Okay. We had one principal, West S. Brown, a part time secretary, a janitor. One teacher per class, and we all did well. We all, no administrators, none of that BS. <laughs> it was very simple and plain. In fact, the principal, West S. Brown, was one of the best teachers ever. He also led the, uh, the band, the choir, in charge of all theatrical presentations, like the Christmas plays. And he taught English, eighth grade English. I learned more from that man than any other teacher in my life except for Dr. Ruth Stevens at Tennessee. He was unbelievable. I mean, he was unbelievably fantastic. And everybody was totally, uh, uh, not afraid of him, but totally respected him. He did not mess at all with West S. Brown. Because <laughs> if he did, he'd call your mother, and your mother would beat the crap out of you. He just didn't do it. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> and uh, I assume Mike wasn't on the school board at that time. I just want to make sure. Oh. I know, no, he wasn't. No, my father, as a matter of fact, was on the school board during that period. Okay. Of time. <laughs> and my mother was one of the first, uh, one, one of the first presidents of the PTA, now called PTO. Okay, okay. What sort of issues are facing the school at that time? Well, a lack of equipment for the kids. Uh, one of the first things the PTO did, or the PTA did, was uh, fund monies for a basketball hoop and a backstop. Okay. That was big time because we didn't have that. You know, all we had was a field and you made your own games, softball. That was about it. But now you can play basketball, you know, which was which was great. And also what they did do, because at that time, uh, at lunchtime, you had to go home for lunch. Mm -hmm. Except the, except for the kids who lived in New York, they felt it was too far with no sidewalk, so they could eat in school. But my mother organized on Fridays a free lunch okay. for all the kids. There was a large auditorium in the old school where everybody ha had their lunch. Usually it was very, you know, soup or something like that. But save the kids from going home, you know, in the, in the winter or the rain, you know, in the snow or the rain. And they liked that. And on Saturdays, uh, sometimes they would show movies, old Charlie Chaplin movies. Okay. And that, you know, free. And everybody kept the, uh, had the kids doing something. And also she helped organize with the three uh, different churches, a dance for the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade kids is called the Teensters. And every month during the year, except for the summer, they would alternate where the dance would be. And that was, oh, that was fantastic. You know, dancing with girls? Oh my God, that was, <laughs> it was wonderful. Shoot, sure. I wish I was here to DJ that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess my point is growing up in Norway was just idyllic, surely. Excellent. <laughs> after high school, I mean, after uh, uh, Norwood Public School, 
you told me uh, uh, the regional high school is not here. So you went, or how'd you wind up in Tenafly? You said you're a Tenafly class. Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Twice of going to close, the old close to high school or mm -hmm. Tenafly High School. And the thing about going to college, it was recommending you went to Tenafly High School. They thought Tenafly High School had a better reputation. Uh, is that true or not? I have no idea. But that was a recommendation. So okay. all the kids were thinking about going to college for the most part. Not all went to uh, Tenafly High School. Okay, okay. So how big was the graduating class there at that time? It was about 220, 225. Okay. In fact, uh, we had a 60th reunion like that, seven years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> about, that must have been interesting. Was there it a lot was. Of a, lot you know, of a, lot, a lot of people are still with us in that class, which is really surprising. That's excellent. Really was, there a good, surprising. was there a good amount of Norwood folks that year? Uh, there, there were nine kids from Norwood, but I was the only one who, no, myself and Nancy Teters were the only two in the class of 53 that attended the 60th reunion. Okay. The 50th, there were more, like Indian Kilpatrick, uh, who else? Helen Hassestab, I believe. Donald Kreppen. That's all I can think of. Okay. Where, where, where'd they hold the 60th, was it? They, they held it at uh, the uh, hotel in Tenafly. What's the name okay. of that place? The, the uh, Clinton, that one? The yeah, Clinton, right. The Clinton. Okay, okay. Because we, I, I had some cl uh, classmates who had connections with the, the country club, Tenafly Country Club. We could have okay. held it there. And they didn't want to do it. They said it would be too expensive. But come on. I mean, after 60 years, you can't spend another $5 or $10. I mean, I'm <laughs> you know, get on the bus and go home, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> so, it, was, yeah. it, it was good, though. But it wasn't a dinner. It was a brunch. They expected <laughs> people to come to California for a brunch. I mean, you know, I guess they were thinking about their own convenience. They were worried about uh, driving at night. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, you turn 75, you become a little foggy. I mean, get, get with the program, for God's sake. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. So what was the next stop after high school, getting back to your, your own history in town here? Well, after, after high school, I went down to uh, Tennessee for my, uh, my college. Okay, okay. And uh, I love Tennessee. My first trip to Tennessee was by bus going through the Shenandoah Valley and the Blue Mountains. And uh, I think it was, you know, what else? It was the Appalachians that I crossed over. I couldn't, couldn't believe how beautiful the area is. So I was really happy to get to uh, Tennessee. Now, I, I, you know, back in the day, you didn't visit a school. You just, if you were selected or permitted to go, you went, that's all. Okay. And I was okay. happy to go there. And I think I was the only, well, I was the only Yankee in my dormitory. <laughs> I'm probably the only Irish Catholic in my dormitory. <laughs> but it took a little while for them to get used to me. But I think I, I was there less than three weeks, and all of a sudden about 20 guys come running to my room. They wanted <laughs> to kick my ass because I was a Yankee. And one of the guys, my, my friend said, well, no. One of the guys I knew, Jim LeMay, said, he's not a bad guy. He said, yeah, he's not a bad guy. So, so I said, okay, you take, you take the Pledge of Allegiance to the Confederacy, and we will not beat your ass. I said, that's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, later on, I found out was, there was no truth to that at all. They just wanted to have some fun. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, but as a, result, as, as a result of being an asshole, I did, and uh, I became friends with all of them except for one. Okay. <laughs> uh, and speaking of the Confederacy, uh, you were in the reserves, and, uh, not for the Confederacy, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I joined the reserves right after high school. In fact, I joined the reserve unit uh, in Knoxville, the 394 engineers out of Knoxville. And I uh, went to summer camp at Fort, uh, Fort Campbell and also the Atlanta General Depot. Okay. So... Spent eight years in the reserves. Uh, so it's been a good life. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, uh, so you moved back here after, uh, after the reserves and or college? Right, right after college, well, I, I came back. Okay. 
Uh, what was your degree in? Political, uh, political science. Oh, me too. in political science and history. Okay. I started off a pre-med and I realized after two weeks, ain't no way it's going to happen. <laughs> and that was one of the reasons I went to Tennessee because Tennessee has a, a, one of the biggest medical schools in Memphis. And I thought, you know, if I go to the undergraduate program in Tennessee, I have a better chance of getting into the medical school. Well, I realized I, I was not qualified to become a doctor. If I had become a doctor, probably more deaths at my hands than COVID. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> uh, well, shoot, so what was the next move when you got back? Well, I started working for a company called Liberty Mutual as a claim adjuster. Okay. Worked there, worked there two years and realized it was not for me. I felt as though my job was not, I had a problem, problem with the ethics of the company itself. Okay. How they treated people. As a claim adjuster, I went after bodily injury. That was my body, not, not property, bodily injury. So there are a lot of elderly ladies slipping and falling. So my job is to go out and get a statement from them, a handwritten statement. And you, you, you have to empathize with these people. I mean, you, you, it's bad falls, and some bad injuries, you know, ankles, you know, twisting, a couple of breaks. And I would take that, and I had empathized with them, and I felt so bad for them. And all I could do is give them no more than $25. That's it. Oh, wow. To sell the claim for $25. That was my job. Get, at the period of time, I, got, I couldn't believe it. Because if they had gotten a lawyer, they would have gotten, you know, maybe $1,000 or more. Right, right. So after a while, that just ate at me. So I didn't last very long there at all. So I, I quit that job. <laughs> when, and moved when on. You, uh, I'm probably fast forwarding a couple of years. What first, you, what first got you involved with the town or the council itself? What provoked well, you to even go for it the first time? Good question. We uh, after I, we after March and I we were married in '68. We uh, could not afford living in Norwood. We lived in an apartment in Union City, and my father gave me the property that my house is on right now as a wedding okay. present. Oh, very nice. And, uh, Margie said, "No, we have to go back. We have to build a house in Norwood. We have to." And I was a little reluctant, but finally I said, "Okay." So we did. We came back. And the taxes of my house, this is right before a reevaluation, were a lot more than I expected it to be. So I went to a, a council meeting and I was asking questions and the answers I was getting just really wasn't, wasn't that satisfactory. So then I received a call from the Republican Party, would you like to run for office? I thought about it, I said, well, I lived in town all my life, why not? So I raised my hand, sure, why not? So the first time I ran, I was in, I guess it was 75. I ran with Chubby Bocchino, and Chubby Bocchino was an icon in town. Everyone knew Chubby. Me being in a town, then not as many people knew me as they knew Chubby. Right. So Chubby was ahead of the ticket, and Chubby helped me to cross the finish line. Okay, okay. How old were you at the time? I was 30. What the hell? How old was I? Almost 40 years, 40 years old. Yeah. Okay, okay. 39, yeah, yeah. Who was on the council at the time? You mentioned Chevy Bocchino. Um, well, Larry, Larry, Larry Derrico was on it. Uh, Richie Vogler was on it. Uh, who else was on it? Ray McKenna was the mayor. Okay. Uh, I forget who else was on it. <laughs> no worries. Well, tell, us, tell us about the first term. What went on during uh, your, your first stretch? On, I think it was two terms you, you did the first time. So right. What went on during all that time? What stands out today? Well, one of the big things, right before uh, they changed the zoning on Livingston Street, uh, that was Ray McKenna's thought. He wanted to bring an A&P into Norwood. He felt as though the seniors did not have uh, the proper transportation or could not get to the, the A and P down closer. Okay. Which was a small one. So and all the people living on Livingston Street loved it because they knew their property value was skyrocketing. Yeah. And some of the people who live on High Street, their ancestors uh, owned property 
on 11th Street. Like okay. Joe Ascalis, you know, he complains about the noise, but you know, his, an <laughs> his ancestors were probably one of the causes of the present noise. Revelation. <laughs> so they did very, they did very well when the zoning was changed. Okay, okay. Then people like uh, wanted to extend the zoning, the commercial zoning, south of Broadway and. Thank God, Ray said, no, that's enough. We have enough. Okay, okay. And that's how it stands today, essentially, I think. Yeah, exactly right, yeah. Yep, yep. The, yep. the, only, the only commercial south of, of Broadway and uh, Livingston was a gas station on the corner owned by the Falkensterns. Okay. I should tell you, I interviewed a few of the Falkensterns for my first uh, installment of this. So... Uh... They are an interesting family. They truly are. I mean, they were really involved in town. Some uh, John Falkenstein was a mayor. They had another mayor in that family. Yep. They also cr uh, helped build or create the first semi-professional -prof football team in town. Okay. Okay. What was back, that? Back in the '30s, they were called, I believe, the Norwood Raiders. They were called the Raiders back then. That's I think pretty, it was the greatest. Yeah, I believe it was the greatest. Okay. I have, okay. Hold on. Double check that. <laughs> You've got sources with you. Right. No, no. No. <laughs> I stand correct. It's called the Norwood Red Devils. Oh, the Red Devils. Okay. That, that rings a bell. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Do you know when they changed the name to the Raiders or when uh, the Raiders became prevalent here as far as football? No, I really don't. Uh, because there was no uh, football, organized football during my time. Okay. Uh, I'm not too sure exactly when, because there's no organized sports at all. And I really don't know when, I, I know when we came back to Norwood, there was a little league that was in 75. Right. So probably in the 60s, I would think, or thereabouts, uh, then organized sports came. Well, no, wait a minute, hold on, I stand corrected. No, it was in the fifties, because my my middle brother Bruce was one hell of a baseball player, and his team was a fantastic baseball team. So Nova Little League won the won the county championship, and I think they were one game away from going to the World Series in Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. In fact, okay. there's a picture of them of that team uh, in City Hall. Okay. Where can we find that in the borough hall there? I think I think it's, it might be in the collage of, of pictures. I'm not too sure. Okay, for anybody listening, go check that out. <laughs> uh, yeah. A little piece of history there. Um, yeah. Was it, so was the, uh, was the AMP and new zoning uh, among the proudest or the best accomplishments for you during the first stint? Well, that was actually, it, that happened prior to my Rival. Okay, okay. But that was that was another thing that concerned me a little bit. And also, they were thinking about rezoning, and this happened afterwards. The, the Central Woods, because Central Woods uh, was zoned laboratory research in, interspersed with a little bit of residential, which made it almost impossible to develop on. So they changed the zoning under Ray McKenna to make it more residential. And that, that permitted the development. Okay, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I've even heard of Ray McKenna. So what, what was his, there we go, okay. What was Ray McKenna's legacy as far as mayor in his term here, or his time here? Ray, Ray McKenna, a, a Democrat, was one of the most popular men in town. Uh, if you, uh, the, the, the Democrats loved him, he was a character. <laughs> and one thing on the council, you know, he never, he never disrespected you. And I was a new, I was a newbie on the council, mm -hmm. and we were out number four to two, and he, and the Democrats in control of the town forever and ever and ever, and we were independents. We weren't Republicans. We were independents. We ran as independents, as a matter of okay, fact. Okay, okay. The Republican Club was a Republican club in name only. Two or three people called themselves Republican, but they had they hadn't mm -hmm. put up a winner in years and years and years. So a group of us, including old Democrats, were were annoyed. At 
their party helped Republicans join together and, and form the independent club. And Chubby and I were the first two candidates to run as independents under their club. Okay, okay. And we ran uh, several other candidates as independents. And then the Republican Party came back into existence, supposedly. And the Republican Party ran a slate of candidates themselves against us. Uh, so we all went down and Democrats took control again. Okay, okay. Uh, so that so was then, the then we decided that this is crazy. We'll, we as independents will then now join the, with the Republicans and join, we, we have to for the town. Even though some of the individuals in the Republican Party at that time were assholes. <laughs> well, in the French, they truly were. <laughs> you know, we can't let the Democrats control, continue to control the town. Okay, okay. Uh, so this is around the uh, this, last t last year of your first term was eighty two, correct? Yeah. So yeah. that was around then. This oh, this was all going I'm, on. I'm sorry, I I remember eighty what, eighty six. Yeah, to la la my last year was eighty two. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. And I was out I was out of politics for over what twenty four years until uh, Mayor Kaplan asked me to come back. Uh, that was my next question. <laughs> what drew you back in? Because I'm facing this potential peril in the future now. <laughs> well, there was something that, uh, there was a great rumor, a lot of rumors that the Central Woods would be developed. Okay. Uh, Reducey wanted to expand North Woods. And that's so many area, parts of the area really envir environmentally, environmentally sensitive. So I said, no, it's not a good idea, really. And I, I was getting, we, I'd, I had meetings in my house with all my neighbors, and we mm -hmm. decided that it was not, so we decided to let Mayor Kaplan know, everybody know that we're totally opposed to it. And the group got larger and larger and larger. So Kaplan calls me up because there was nobody to run. It was a one year unexpired term. Okay. None of the young, none, none of the young Turks in the Republican Party wanted it because <laughs> they knew they'd have to run again in, you know, in a year. Right. So he called me and uh, in fact, Peter Alterback called first and said, we want you to run. Barry, you asked me to run 20 years ago. Yeah, I never ran. I said, well, why do you want, why do you want me to run now? I, my ideas are 25 years old, for God's sake. You know, I'm past it. No, he <laughs> wants you to run. Because quite frankly, Barry, nobody else will run. So Kaplan calls me up and said, Barry, if you run, if you win, we'll dedicate all the Central Woods uh, to pristine, uh, uh, environmentally unchallenged and make it central woods, central woods for perpetuity. We'll, we'll line ourselves with the Hackensack uh, Metals Commission. And Barry, you can draw the lines. You can, if you win, you can draw the lines. I said, fine, I'm in there. I'll run. I okay. ran and he was good to his word. And I drew the line where it should be. I had to make it simple. That's the way, the best way to do it. Don't make it complicated, make it simple. Yep. So I made it from, from, uh, uh, 14th Street all the way to Hemlock. And then from the coastal line all the way to the Northville line. Okay, okay. That is pretty easy to picture. So that, that's all been preserved largely ever since, correct? Exactly right. Okay. Because we okay. have that deal with the Meadowlands Commission that it cannot be, it, it cannot be built upon. The past there were two or two in the agreement with with them we have permitted two paths which i think i mentioned and the paths are, are part of the contract period and you can't change the paths unless okay. you have their approval now here's a wrinkle i read because i read the contract mm -hmm. and the contract stated that if for some reason the badlands commission goes out of business all that land under the auspices would revert, its ownership would revert to the state of New Jersey. I said, no way, there's no way. Because all they have to do is not fund it. And it's gone, right? right? Yep. And I said, no, no, we can't do this. So the Midlands Commission agreed with me, but they had to get approval from the state attorney. They got approval from the state of New Jersey. So that waiver was out of the contract. You know, Jesus, I mean, come on, they're trying to screw us. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Okay. 
So, um, was it? So, so who, who was on the council when you rejoined in 06? Uh, no, who was on it? So six. Peter Alton back. Okay. Uh, I don't know if Jim was on the council then. He may have been. Okay, okay. Um, Those watching, he's of course referring to current mayor Jim Barsa. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who else was on the council back then? I guess a few other options would be Ed Condolio, Frank Marino, Joe Espinosa. No, Frank, Frank, was, Frank was on then. Uh, Ed Condolio was, wasn't on then either. I forget who's on then. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, you mentioned uh, mentioned Mayor Kaplan. What was his term? How long was he on the? He was on a, a, a one term and became appointed a judge. And he was a, just a good guy. A really, good, everyone liked him. Really enjoyed. Okay, okay. A great personality. You now easy going and just always smiling. <laughs> That's and good. And he won hands down. And it's interesting because there was a lot of you know thought that there was no way he, he'd uh, become mayor. Being a Republican and also Jewish, there's no way he was going to become mayor. <laughs> and he won, he won handily. Okay, okay. And that, was, that was after uh, Mayor Derek Hall retired or didn't run again or, or actually yeah. lost to him? How did that work? It was... yeah, well, uh, he, didn't yeah, he didn't run again. Uh, he stepped down voluntarily after 20 years. 20 years as mayor. You know? Okay. And you sat that out. You weren't on during Derek Hall at all. No, no. Okay, okay. Uh, you remember anything about the town during that period before we get back to your second period? During the time of uh, Mary Derrickle? Yep. Well, he did so much with Borough North. He really did. Uh, he was the one who really augmented and saw the vision of building uh, Fox Hill for the seniors, 92 units. That was just a major achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, he also, you know, under under his brother being the police chief, uh, he made sure he increased the size of the department. Okay, okay. For the benefit. Now, growing up in Northern, when I was a kid back in the forties. Guess how many cops there were? Two. Two. Okay. Chief Stozer <laughs> and Sergeant Otto Lang. Just two cops. Okay. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> he, he, he also, you know, uh, helped to rezone. Well, to make Fox Hill a reality, he had to help rezone it. And okay. also, he they were able to sell the property that Fox Hill was on to the Senior Development Co Corporation for, I think, one dollar or thereabouts. Okay. So therefore. The seniors' tax is only on the improvement, not the property. That's excellent. <laughs> yeah, and then, but they're, they're still they aren't happy about their own tax. They're paying three, four, five thousand dollars a year. The thing is too much. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you, jumping back to your your second term here. Um, I had to keep jumping around on you. you. You've got a lot of history to tell in a short period of time on on here, mm -hmm. but. Uh, <laughs> What, uh, during your second run here from 2006 to the present, uh, what, what do you say some of your favorite things that have happened in town as far as on well, the health council? Mayor Basso, Mayor Basso took the example of Kaplan and he, I told him, hey, Jimmy, we should preserve Fox Hill. Mm -hmm. It's all wetlands from Macon to Totopan from Broad, uh, Broadway up to Northville. And he agreed. So then we made a second deal with uh, the Meadowlands Commission to preserve that property for perpetuity. Okay. So that was, you know, so now we have two parts of the town preserved for perpetuity. I mean, in, in, in their natural state. I mean, that's, that, that to me, I think that's just a, a big achievement for Norwood itself. That's excellent. A hundred years from now, it'll be preserved. It's a bit, well, that's good. 
that's a big attraction for people in town as far as hiking or just having it around. So, I mean, that, that's a coup to pull off all that preserved land over these, over these years. So. And there was, there was some disagreement within the Republican party. You can't do that. You know, we, we, should, we need the development, yada, yada, yada. BS, you know, we don't need the development. <laughs> no, it's not, it's, it gives it a charm to have this sort of preserved land all over town rather than development everywhere. Exactly. Not right. only as a tenure resident, but uh, just the same. Right. Um, and no, that's why that's why Noah still has that charm about it. I mean, going just driving down Broadway and you just see woodlands. You know, I mean, yep. it's that's great. Yeah. You drive out McClellan past Fox Hill and you see all oh, just woodlands to your left. I mean, wow, and also to your right. <laughs> Yep. And is there anything you prefer that didn't that wouldn't wouldn't have happened during either of your terms in retrospect? On the flip side of that. Good question. <laughs> Doesn't have to be any answer necessarily, but uh, no, I, I, nothing's happened that to in my estimation has been that has been detrimental to the town. Okay. I, I don't think so. I really don't. I mean, we've had some flaws, maybe some misjudgments, mm -hmm. uh, but overall, I think mean, Noah has grown in a nice way they, under the stewardship, quite frankly, of the, 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 the four mayors. I mean, Ray McKenna was also a good mayor. He did a lot of good for Norwood and he followed by by Gus Derrico, a good job, Kaplan, and Jim. I mean, four, we've had four good mayors, quite frankly, in my estimation. Okay, okay. Um, gonna give you a couple of opportunities for random recollection. Uh, best restaurant to come and go during your lifetime here, and where was it? Uh, it was called Zinkies, on the corner of uh, Blanche and Tapan Road. It's now, now houses. Okay, when was that there? And what I was there from, I think, the 20s all the way up to that a major fire, I guess, in the 60s or the 70s. I heard about the fire. That's uh, the name yeah. of the place was Zinkies. Okay, okay. Yeah, but it changed hands about, it's called Rainbow Inn, it changed, but the initial name was Zinkies. It okay. was a great restaurant. What kind of place? It was a typical American, you know? Okay. And now by the school, uh, there was a restaurant uh, Villa, La, Villa La Pata, I think it was, Villa La Pata, it was an old hotel uh, with a restaurant and the new chef came in, the owner, and to go to dinner there was unbelievable. The first time in my life I had about a three course meal, a four course meal, my parents, my father used to always take us there on my mother's birthday, my mother would do the same thing with my father on his birthday. Okay. We loved it there. Plus, they had a bocce ball court outside. Very nice. So myself and my two brothers, we played bocce ball. I mean, we just love that crap, really. <laughs> that was a great restaurant, though. What Bill, was that Bill there until? Oh, uh, we'll say the 80s, late 80s. Yeah, that was taken, torn down, and the homes were built by the school there. Okay, okay. I was going to ask you, that was my next question, was what was, uh, what's there now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about any notable nice spots that have come and gone? We mentioned Whitmer. Well, yeah, well, I, I'd say Maple Grove, that uh, little roadside hot dog beer place. Okay, okay. That was on Peel Mountain Road. That was just great. And also a, a place called Jerry's. Initially, Jerry's was called Hossenstocks. They have two brothers called Hossenstocks who ran it. Helen Hostop, the daughter of one, was mm -hmm. in my class, so from grammar school and also high school. And all on, on every Sunday, every, most of the men in town went there for a drink. At, at the church, or after playing handball, they'd go over and have a drink. And the nice thing about it is that no telephone, so the wives cannot call their husbands to get their ass home. <laughs> the hard job, Many a time, because every, every Sunday, my grandparents would come over from White Plains and had dinner with us. Okay. My father would go out the front door, and my, my grandfather would go out the back door. They'd jump in a car and go to house stops. <laughs> uh, we, we couldn't get them home. 
So sure. my mother would say, Keep boys, get on your bikes and get your father and your grandfather home. We're going to have dinner in about a half hour. <laughs> so we go over there, ride our bikes over there. Yeah. My father, come on, kids, come on. You guys want a Coke? Yeah, oh, well, yeah, okay. You want some, my grandfather, you want some potato chips? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, enjoy it. You guys go over there and play the shuffleboard. So that the <laughs> shuffleboard machine there was, uh, the shuffleboard table was fantastic. In fact, that shuffleboard table right now that was in Hot Stops is now in the American Legion. Okay, okay. So my, my, my father and my grandfather, in a way, bribed us to stay there and have a great time. We didn't want to go home either. What the <laughs> hell? Why, why go home? We're getting free Coke. You never had Coke. You never, you know, Coke was never <laughs> at home. Come on. No. Right, right. You had, that, water or milk, you had water or milk orange juice, period. That was the current Cherry's place, you said? Yeah. And yeah, that so was a fan, fantastic spot. Good, good size place even now. And it's changed well, it, 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 yeah, since so, I've been here. <laughs> yeah, it, so. it was so small at the time. You know, it's about one third of the size. And okay, it changed, okay. and I stopped, sold it. It changed hands many times. Right. Many. Every, every, every neighborhood has that place. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, now, uh, how about some, uh, give me one or two off the top of your head or more uh, colorful figures in Norwood history that we wouldn't have otherwise been asking you about. I would say the most colorful were the Conti brothers. There were three brothers, uh, lived in a little farmhouse east of Yorkview, my section of town. Okay. Uh, they came over from New York City back in the 30s, and the house was empty. And my, the story I was told, they kind of squatted. They just moved in. Okay. <laughs> and they, they fixed it up, and Mrs. Connie uh, made money by lots of chickens, sold eggs, had a cow, gave out milk. I mean, it was like a small little farm. Oh, and the three Connie brothers were the ones who were the great hunters. They're the ones who were the Hey, they were all poachers, quite frankly. Okay. <laughs> uh, and they were just great people. They all were all part of the fire department, all part of the American Legion. And they were characters, really characters. <laughs> but good guys and good hearts. In fact, somehow, somewhere after World War II, they were all in World War II in the uh, European theater. And they came okay. back with all kinds of, Paul, all kinds of weapons. I mean, uh, pistols, uh, machine guns, uh, grease guns, rifles. I have no idea how they got them home. Well, wow. <laughs> you know, they got them home. The whole, uh, the whole room was filled with guns. Okay. I, mean, I, don't, know, I, I, I don't know the count, but it was, to me, back now, in those days, it seemed like a lot, like 50, 75, uh, you know, just a lot of weapons, a lot of weapons. <laughs> wow, wow. Um, and another guy, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to think of it. Uh, what's his name? It'll come to me in a second. There are some other characters too. But what, you know, one of the great people was the, the priest in our church, Father Charles O'Shaw. Tell me uh, about him. He, he uh, a Carmelite, he came to Norwood back in the 40s. And I was an altar boy for him. And he singly handed put the arm on every Catholic family in town to build a Mac Inception school. Okay, okay. And you were on the school board for them at one point too, right? I was, yeah. And that was towards that tail end before the enrollment dropped off precipitously. Because at, at the time, we he had a, an agreement with the uh, a group of nuns. I'm not too, I don't know, the Amero no nuns, I forget now. No, they were Carmelite nuns, I believe, yeah. That they were, you know, uh, man the school, you know, mm. provide all the teachers to the school. And as that number dwindled, then you had to go, you know, get uh, non non-religious to be the teachers, which cost more. And all of a right. sudden, schools started to price itself out a little bit. Because okay. in all the public schools are good school. And they said, well, let's go over and instead of paying a couple thousand dollars a year, we'll save the money, you know, and go there. And that's what they did. Right, right. I can't believe I forgot this earlier, but uh, tell me about the history of the American Legion in, uh, in Norwood. Well, the American Legion uh, was founded right after World War II. Okay. One of, the, one, of the, one of the first commanders was a woman, oh. Mary Trout. She was born in Norwood. Okay. Uh, okay. In fact, she was the first child to be baptized at uh, Mac Conception. 
back in the 20s. The, the, the American Conception Church used to be uh, a so-called men's club. Mm -hmm. And they kind of went out of business, the church bought it. And they, uh, that's, we used to have, I think mass before that was held, I believe in the firehouse. And then they, they bought that and the Conlites were there for forever until about 15, 18 years ago. And the are not enough Carmelites, so uh, the Carmelites said, "Well, when we went to the Archdiocese, said, we we can't we can't supply a priests there. So why don't you help us and take it over?" And we've had secular priests there ever since. Okay, okay. But the the Carmelites was unbelievably fantastic priest, really. Okay, okay. And then. Uh, Tell us about, uh, I guess, the impact American Legion's had over the in the town over the decades since it was set up. Well, it was the American Legion really started the Memorial Day parades. Okay. And they've always, they've always been an altruistic group. And they used to have dances there. One of the big fundraisers were dances. Mm -hmm. And uh, several times a year they would have, uh, well, one of the dances was, uh, Hunters would bring back, you know, whatever, donate deer meat or, or rabbit, pheasant, and Lou Bedrado would make, cook, actually cook the dinner. And he used to make polanta too. And that was, and they always had a band and a great dinner and a packed house downstairs. <laughs> and uh, that's what one of the main uh, money raises, which, you, need, you know, you need money to keep things going. I mean, today, the insurance for the American Legion is like 25 grand a year. 25 grand a year for insurance because oh, of the wow. bar. You know, right, right. The, bar does, the bar doesn't bring that kind of money. <laughs> right, right. How many active members are there today? Well, I think they have a total membership of over, over 80. Okay, okay. Uh, active, I'd say 30, maybe 40. Okay, okay. How many attend meetings? Maybe 20. Okay, it was still alive and kicking here, though. Oh, it is. I mean, uh, <laughs> it really is. Can you describe Fred the... Uh, Ryan, Fred Ryman is the commander, and he does a hell of a job. He really does. And Steve Minch is the uh, adjutant. They, they just... We have, they have, it's a good leadership team. Can you tell me about the Memorial Day parades that they had at, the, at their peak? What did those look like? I know they were well, a little quieter these days, but back, I'm saying when they were first getting rolling or... you know, even Well, the, back then... I mean, everyone participated. Every group, okay. and, and, you know, and the American Legion, I mean, they were all back in World War II, so they were much younger, so they could march, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes you have 30 to 40 members of the American Legion dressed in their uniform marching. Okay. They've always had a couple of bands. The high schools were represented, the Boy Scouts were, every, every group was in town was represented. It was just, it was a big, big parade, a huge parade. Of course, the fire company, I think that back in the time, initially, they had maybe one truck. The ambulance squad didn't, wasn't really in existence at the time when it first started. When they started, maybe they had, uh, maybe they had a truck. Uh, but, but it was huge, and they always wound up at the American Legion. And the start of tradition, uh, you know, if you're in a parade, uh, come out over the American Legion and give out free hot dogs and soda or water. And okay. that's been a long tradition. So it was, you know, just, it was important. After World War, because everyone was really involved in World War II, even mm -hmm. kids. I mean, our job was uh, to go around collecting any metal pans or pots that people didn't want. we bring them to the school. The school would then bring them down to Hackensack to be melted, supposedly for armaments. So that was, we were in, invested in it. And also, we had, a, in the springtime, we'd go up and pick this like, it's like a fluffed dandy, dandelion uh, silk and bring it in bags and bags. And we were told that was needed for life preservers. Okay. Now, I don't know if it was used for life preservers or not, but it was, that, was, that was what we told. And we brought down bags, bags and bags of it. And uh, it went to the school and the school then sent it to the proper authority. So we, we really thought that's all we were invested. Also, everyone at the time had a, a victory garden. And okay. uh, my mother had a huge, we had a huge garden. My mother would can 
uh, all the time. We had much, enough food in the basement to last a couple of years. <laughs> all from the canyon. We're trying for that right now with the COVID uh, resurgence. But <laughs> <laughs> and also a lot of such, we had, my family had over 100 chickens. Oh, wow. So we had our poultry and we had our eggs and all, and then we had our meat. Wow. And almost every, almost every uh, family in Yorkview had some sort of uh, livestock. Uh, Mr. Hane had raised some pigs. Um, Doc Titus had a, a cow. Uh, and everybody else had chickens for the most part. But everybody had a garden. My understanding is you can't really do that now. Was there a time when, I guess, raising livestock was curbed or, or banned altogether? Yeah, it was. I'm not too sure what day that was, but then, you know, you couldn't have, couldn't have chickens, you know, unless you grandfathered into it. And after okay. World War II, uh, we got rid of the chickens. I'd say by nine, five years after the war, all the chickens were gone. Okay, so it's been a while. There, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I remember speaking with somebody at the Environmental Commission a couple of years ago who was interested in, in kind of revitalizing the prospect of keeping livestock in town. I think we should. I mean, I think it's a great idea. What's wrong? What? Well, they said, well, you get rats, you know, you get the weasels. Oh, come on. I mean, in the, please. No. Right. <laughs> All right, that's actually an interesting segue for this question. What would you like to see happen in the future as far as uh, new things for Norwood? See, you've seen all of this. I would, I, would love to, I would love to see you know, a, a joint operation between private money and municipal money or public monies to build an ice, indoor ice rink. That I would, would love nice. to see that. That would, that's, that would be fantastic. Because it's so popular these days and ice time is so expensive. I know my, my grandson played the hockey for Burn Catholic. And I had to go to the ice house or up it's up in like Sotsville. I mean, and the, the ice time is hard to get, you know, the hours are unusual. Mm -hmm. So there's a big market for it. You right, get two right. you build two rinks, one you know, mainly for hockey and one for just individual playing. Or when there's no hockey, you know, or I staying in there. But hockey is so big now they they, yeah. they play hockey year round. That would be a nice addition. I can't ice skate. I can't do it to save my life, but I think a lot of people would would oh, like it yeah. a lot. Oh, they would. <laughs> oh, they, yeah. yeah. They'd be good, you know. Uh, and there's room. And there's room for it uh, in uh, North Woods. Uh, I'm not North Woods. Over in Fox Hill, east of McClellan. The town owns most of our property. And it's not environmentally sensitive there, sensitive there, so it could be built there. Okay. Or, or it could be built in one of the factories. You know, right. Modify one of the factories. I would agree with that. A lot, a lot of potential in those areas. Yeah. So, uh, so next time you run, that could be part of your uh, <laughs> platform. Whoa. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but. Uh, well, now that you're done running, much as I tried to uh, get you to go for another term, uh, what do you want? Uh, what do you, What do you want the town to remember Barry Scott for as both private and public citizen? What's your legacy here? What would you like to see it be? Preserving uh, the uh, Central Woods and Fox Hill. Okay. Okay. So, and from that, you know, all the all the things you do, and all there's so many jobs, responsibilities, and a lot of minutiae sitting on the council. But to me, that was important. Right. And I would say if this winds up being my only term, I was very happy to get the uh, both the, uh, the police and the schools, given what was going on uh, with school shootings, and uh, also very happy to see uh, you know, the, our kind of timely re responses to the COVID pandemic it felt like we didn't waste a lot of time getting our arms around it. We just jumped on it. And well, you're right. That's an interesting point. Well, we had police protection in the school. That's yeah. one of the best things Norwood has done. And thank God it was a cooperative effort, you know, to diminish the cost to a certain extent. But it's important, really. And to yeah. hear the story is how the kids love the cops. And when when the Krapos told us that one of the cops was invited to one of the kids' base birthday parties. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. It's great, oh. man.
What we a got some good guys on there. Yeah. What a positive influence the cops have, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Kids see them. They're not remote. They know who they are, and that's that's wonderful. So the, the guarantee when the kids graduate from grammar school, they'll love the cops, not hate the cops, right? And realize the cops are always, you know, a force for good, not a force for evil. So that's, that's a, really a, a positive thing for Norman. Yeah, yeah, and I'm glad to keep renewing it. And I remember, at least when, when it was first being discussed, there was a couple other municipalities that were really against, not that they were against it, but they weren't cooperating with each other, the different uh, organs of, of government. So you hear about months and months of no police in the school when it really should have just, everybody should have found a way given what was going on. And we did it just second thing, pretty much. The second thing I really want, really and truly, and it's too bad you're no longer on the council because you're really leading the, the band, is to have the, the Greenway on the old Erie, Erie Railroad tracks from kind of yes. like all the way up to Nyack. I mean, come on. You can't, and that's so, that'd be so fantastic. I mean, it's so, so it's beneficial like to the town. Really, truly. Yeah, yeah, and it sounds like effectively you enjoyed you enjoyed that part of the time that you were growing up. Yeah. So it sounds like you're hunting during on that drag, or have they are you are able to? But uh, well, the, yeah. you know, the, the, the the tracks have been abandoned for I don't know how many years now. I mean, right. they, they lost all their customs in Northvale. And at one time, it was a vital line. That uh, one reason why my parents moved to Norway was because of the train service. We had two uh, commuter tra uh, train okay. services, one in the West Shore and one here in, uh, in the O'Leary tracks. And uh, the, the commute to New York City, because almost everybody worked in New York City for the most part, right. that was just a great way to go to work, the trains. Sure, in fact, you? at one time, Norway had two post offices. Where's the second one located? Uh, by the air, by the uh, freight tracks, the old, they were passenger tracks at the time up in West Norwood. Okay, that little community, that... those stores on Broad Street. Okay, I was gonna say Broad Street, okay. Yeah, okay. there's the post office there. And and that town, part of the town is always called West Norwood. Always West Norwood because right. of the West Norwood post office. Now, uh, speaking of town history and Broad Street, since you mentioned it, uh, as a as a largely lifelong resident, give us your Norwood pizza of choice. <laughs> <laughs> I like John's. It's Where's that? called John's. Well, one on Broad Street. It's changed its name a couple of times. It's still is it called John's now? Mario's. <laughs> Mario's now. Okay. Uh, okay. Cousins is okay, but I, I I like Mario's. Okay. Okay. I gotta make sure to ask that question to everyone going forward. I can like it. I've been getting uh, the advertisements from a pizza uh, place in Chicago. I just ordered two of their pizzas. Blue Malnati's? Uh, I don't know. I forget the name. Yeah, that might be it. That might be it. I just ordered it about two months ago. It's fantastic. It's pretty tasty. Yeah. Oh, uh, good to hear. Good to hear. <laughs> oh, God, that's great. I figured like, I had to be home I, for eight I, months. I, I'm going to try I, everything. I, so. <laughs> I was, you know, was going to order four. I said, no, let me order two to see if I like it. Because it's a little bit expensive. So I expected the uh, delivery sometime uh, this coming week. I can't wait to try it. Oh, those I just, are good. I mean, the those picture of it, it looks so fantastic, yeah? <laughs> and and pizza, those, but pizza those, is really soul food. You know, you know that. What's that? <laughs> pizza is soul food. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, well, sure. I, I think I was supposed to only keep you for about a half hour, but Zoom hasn't cut me off. So, <laughs> I... Uh, what, what I probably should do is let you enjoy the rest of your day, but reserve the possibility of bringing you back because I have a feeling, given your history, a lot of people are going to want to hear some more from you. I feel yeah, like we're just right. scratching the surface. So I'll be happy, be, be happy to. It's been a lot of fun. And, and, and yeah. thank you for this endeavor. It's a great endeavor. It really is. Really. Uh, I, I, it's because it's of guys like you that, and, and Councilman Marino and, and a couple others that have told me stories over the years and, and you know, the dedication of the basketball court recently where, you know, if I went back to my hometown, I couldn't find 10 families I even knew. Nonetheless, somebody that could capture the history and speak of the town so highly as you guys and others do. And uh, for those of us that are relatively new to town, it's a history I, I just became interested in preserving during my time on the council. So, uh, so I thank you for giving us one of the opening, uh, opening interviews for this whole thing. Yeah. And, you, and you said you plan on talking to Larry Derrickall, right? 
I want to, yes. Uh, well, offline, he, uh, you got to give me his information so I can get a line. He, he's, 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 he's a font of information. He really is. Okay. And okay. yeah, he'll, he'll add a, a, another dimension to the story. He really will. <laughs> and he and, I were cla- he and I were classmates, by the way. Okay, okay. Uh, he didn't make it to the 60th with you? You didn't name him before? No, he went to, he went to close to high school. I went to close to, okay, high school. okay. So, okay, that explains that. <laughs> Excellent, but but sure, I'll leave you to it for now. But I thank okay. you for coming on and. Uh, thank you, Paul. You have a great a, day. You too, and obviously, thank you for your service as well. It's my pleasure, man. <laughs> I'll Go talk on. to you shortly. Take care, buddy. Be Take good. Take care. You too.